Professor Balcharovich, thank you so much for taking time to, first of all, be with us this morning, but also to address uh, the Europe uh, 2020 Summit. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank you as well for agreeing to chair the Growth and Competitiveness, Competitiveness Commission of the Lisbon Council that we will be launching uh, later this year. We look forward to a lot of very good, actionable ideas about really the, the main topic of the day, how we can get Europe uh, growing again. Well, thank you very much, first of all, for this opportunity to address such a distinguished audience and to, for the opportunity to work on an extremely important uh, topic, uh, how to lastingly revive economic growth in the European countries. Exactly. Thank you. Well, that, that is the topic of the day today, but I'd like to start with a slightly historical mm -hmm. question and go and talk a little bit about Poland, in particular Poland in the 1990s. Uh, you instituted a set of reforms uh, very early on then uh, that, of course, there were two years of recession, uh, but after that uh, spurred a growth spurt uh, that's really almost unprecedented uh, in this part of the world. You were ahead of all of the other transition economies, and it's a, it's a level of growth that Poland, despite the, the little warning signs we see now that, that continues mm. in Poland, it continues to outperform the rest of the European economy on growth. What's your secret? What is the secret mm. of all of this success in this area where the rest of Europe so much As needs to learn? As you know, there are no secrets. Uh, we have two episodes of accelerated reforms in Poland. The first one was just after the collapse of socialism, uh, which ended in bankruptcy, so we inherited an economic catastrophe, which spurred us to move ahead with a very comprehensive economic program on broad fronts to deal with hyperinflation and with deal with falling GDP. So there was a combination of tough macroeconomic stabilization and a lot of free market reforms. And after a while, it started to work. So first, shortages disappear, inflation has fallen sharply, and output started to grow. Output started to grow after one year and a half. The second is perhaps more applicable to the political situation in some other European countries. This was the period between 1997 and 2000. There was no deep dramatic crisis, but there was a threat of a slowdown. And the coalition government, uh, in which I was a member of, introduced uh, a number of uh, deep fundamental reforms. First, we accelerated privatization. Second, we restructured uh, the mining sector. Third, we have introduced a fundamental pension reform. Fourth, uh, uh, we started the health service reform. And this was done without much protests under a rather exotic coalition, which consisted of an umbrella organization around the trade union Solidarność, Solidarity, and the free market party, Freedom Union, which I was then heading. So comprehensive programs, which are presented to the population against the background of what would have happened without these programs can sometimes work. Thank you. Well, you, as you know, we're in the fifth year of crisis in Europe now. All of this began in 2008. And of course, 2011 was supposed to be the year of the recovery. And so was uh, 2012. And so was 2013. And now we learn that it's just been pushed back to 2014 again. Why is that happening? Why is this recovery that we keep predicting is just around the corner uh, never seems uh, to arrive? Well, first I would say that situation differs across countries. And you have countries which introduce radical reforms like the Baltics. When uh, output recovers, uh, Ireland is a different situation than some other problem uh, countries. Uh, so this is the first observation. The second observation, in countries which are pla still plagued with problems, there may be uh, the legacy of an extreme boom which went bust and left a legacy of very high debt mm -hmm. and uncertainty. <clears throat> and usually it takes more time to deal with this legacy. Second point is about policies. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, First of all, uh, I think what matters is the structure of fiscal consolidation. I, there's a lot of literature which would suggest that expenditure-based fiscal consolidation, those which are uh, mostly based on reducing current spending through reforms, work better than those who are, in, are mostly based on increasing tax rates. Mm -hmm. And when I look at various countries, I can see huge differences in the structure of fiscal consolidation. Mm -hmm. Second, amount of structural reforms. 
countries which inherited very rigid labor markets or product markets uh, suffered in the first place if they delayed structural reforms. So basically the lesson would be <clears throat> make quickly a correct diagnosis of your problems which differ across countries, present the therapy, launch it on the broad front and be persistent. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot of people, as you know, are blaming the so-called austerity policies. They're saying that it's been too deep and gone on too long and may perhaps have been the wrong economic uh, uh, policy uh, for times uh, when Europe was already having uh, growth uh, difficulties. Is that the point of view uh, correct in your view? Well, first of all, I have noticed that this word austerity is used in two meanings. First, as a bad word as an invective, like say neoliberalism, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in such application is not only useless, it's counterproductive because mm -hmm. one cannot uh, reasonably mm -hmm. argue and discuss problems by using invectives. Mm -hmm. Second, it is usually meant by austerity that uh, uh, excessive uh, reduction in spending. Mm -hmm. But as I said, uh, the experience uh, and research would suggest that if you inherit huge public debt, uh, huge deficit, and the related uh, loss of confidence, yes. then you have to act on confidence, not on words, mm -hmm. but on uh, with big actions. Uh, and then uh, I think large fiscal consolidation, which I rely most on reducing spending through reforms, mm -hmm. are more hopeful than just uh, increasing spending especially when you would have to rely on official donors. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Some of the countries <clears throat> in Europe right now have catastrophically large problems. Uh, we all know about Greece and Spain, uh, unemployment uh, being among uh, one of the major, major uh, worries uh, in those places. Uh, what message would you have or what recommendations would you have uh, for the, the peripheral countries in Europe that are in such serious difficulties right now? But first I would notice that uh, some substantial reforms have been already introduced, mm -hmm. say uh, with some delay in certain countries, like in Greece, but still. Uh, in Greece, uh, deep uh, pension reform, mm -hmm. uh, some uh, other reforms on the fiscal side. Uh, in Italy, uh, also pension reform, lots of reform in Spain. They can time, they have to be supplemented, uh, extended, and sufficient. But I would not be surprised if this is done that there would be, you know, these countries would recover. Mm -hmm. The situation is not hopeless. Paradoxically, it is the more distortions you inherit, the more room for reforms you have. So if mm -hmm. only you introduce these reforms in a sustained way, the, the country can recover. This is the history of Poland I mentioned. Mm -hmm. We inherited huge dis distortions. Mm -hmm. We had a catastrophe of hyperinflation, but also falling output. A large and sustained package of reforms mm -hmm. has worked. So it's, again, correct diagnosis and persistence. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, whether the country recovers or not, depends on domestic politics, yes. including civil society. So it is a time for mobilization of those people who believe that economic growth requires uh, extended economic freedom. It requires uh, rather limited and honest government, mm -hmm. and they would press mm -hmm. uh, for these important things. Okay, thank you. Now, Europe is, of course, not only the periphery countries. There are the very large countries at the core of the Eurozone. I mean, of course, France and Germany in particular. Um, they have issues, too. Mm -hmm. What would your advice and recommendations be for uh, the core European countries? And, in terms of ensuring I don't, their future I don't health. want to, to, to pretend that I have advice for everyone. <laughs> okay. But looking from the outside, I think first Germany is a very instructive case because some 10 years ago, Germany was in the situation like the pre present Italy. Mm -hmm. And through courageous reforms on the, with respect to welfare state, labor market, wage moderation, increasing productivity, German economy became healthy. And now it's a strong man of Europe, while 10 years ago, German economy was a weak mm -hmm. man of Europe. So with proper reforms, if only launch is sustained, can work. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, I think, the main uh, message. But to be launched and sustained, they need support yes. from a sufficiently large part mm -hmm. of the population, of uh, civil society, not only political party, but even Germany.
-hmm. would be stronger if Germany deregulated the service sector. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. And if Germany and France supported uh, the completion of a single market, which is uh, not completed, especially mm -hmm. in the service sector. On France, we know that uh, relatively demographic situation cannot compensate mm -hmm. for problems like the highest spending to GDP ratio in Europe, I mean budgetary yes. spending, yes. like uh, the public debt approaching, what, 90% of GDP, mm -hmm. like many rigidities in the economies, including those in the labor market, which were abolished in Spain or in Greece or France. Certainly it's not above the economic laws. Nobody is above economic laws. Mm -hmm. So one has to um, do what is uh, necessary given the proper diagnosis of uh, economic situation. I have many friends in, friends in France uh, which know. Mm -hmm. And what is what necessary? To do. What is necessary? Well, it's stemming from the diagnosis, fiscal side. Mm -hmm. I think uh, reducing spending to GDP ratio through reforms, and I think is a plan to do, mm -hmm. and removing uh, rigidities, into strengthening uh, confidence, because ultimately policies which work, if you inherit lots of problems, are confidence rising, and this is the best demand policy, increasing mm -hmm. confidence mm -hmm. so that investors, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. and consumers spend more. Mm -hmm. And supply-side reforms, mm -hmm. which remove rigidities, which uh, allow productivity and employment to grow. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Uh, this has been a fascinating discussion, and it makes me very excited uh, to see the work of the upcoming uh, Growth and Competitiveness uh, uh, Commission. I'll just leave you with one more question. If there were two or three things that you could change, what would those be? Uh, you mean in Poland? No, I or mean uh, I mean in Europe uh, at large uh, that would uh, would allow us uh, to get out of this rut where we never seem to have the growth that we so obviously need, uh, not just for economic statistic purposes, but uh, to raise uh, the prosperity of uh, well, people. Well, of course, I do not have any magic formula. I would only say that do not expect that bailouts would solve your problem, because they can't. It is up to you meaning a democratic country to identify your problems, to improve policies, and to solve them. And this is possible. Mm. Thank you so much, Professor Balcerowicz, mm. and we look forward to seeing you in Brussels personally soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.